struggling to get your JK BMS connected and communicating with your SunSync inverter. Well, today I'll show you what simple mistake not to make in order to get it connected and communicating. Uh, we'll also look at what information the BMS is sending to the inverter and we'll test how the charge and the discharge limits interact between the inverter and the BMS. I reckon the first thing you need to do is to make sure that you have a stable version of the firmware installed, especially if you've just purchased your JK BMS. Now I'm not going to say the latest version because new releases of firmware can sometimes be a little bit buggy. Now I'll give you guys a great example of this. At the moment I have version 15.11 installed, but previously I had version 15.17 installed, but there was this force charge request, um, as I remember it, being sent to the inverter, and this wouldn't allow the battery to be discharged even though the battery was at 100% state of charge. So I downgraded the firmware back to 15.11 and everything seems to be working fine. Now there is a small trick in order to downgrade the firmware on these BMSs and if you want to know more about that stay tuned because it will be coming up in a future video. Now before we get the communications connected I'm going to assume that you guys already have your power cables connected between the battery and the inverter and everything is powered up and running but just without communications. So if that is the case let's go ahead and look at how to connect up one battery or one BMS to your inverter. Now later on in the video we will have a look at how to connect up two batteries in parallel but for now let's have a look at one. So the first thing you need to do is to select the appropriate CAN protocol for your inverter. So to do this just open up the JK BMS app and then head over to settings. Then scroll down to CAN protocol number and then select 001 DAE or DIA or DAE, low voltage hybrid inverter however you want to say that and then click OK to save the setting to the BMS. Then you need to set the dip switches on the BMS interface board to address number zero. Now setting address number zero means that this BMS will be seen as the master even though we've only got one at the moment. Um, now it could already probably be set to number one from when you did the firmware update, um, but if it is just set it back to number zero. So luckily with this setup uh, we can use the standard ethernet cable for the communication. Because the inverter can high and low pinouts, that's pin four and five, on this inverter matches the CAN high and low pinouts on the BMS. Although this does vary, or it can vary from inverter to inverter. So now plug one end of that ethernet cable into the CAN port on the BMS and the other end of the ethernet cable into the CAN RS485 port on the inverter. And just to note this yellow ethernet cable is the cable that came with my SunSync inverter. So in the settings menu on the inverter select battery and then battery type. And then on this screen select lithium select the battery capacity, the maximum charge amps and the maximum discharge amps and then select CAN and then click OK. And as you can see this takes us back to the settings menu. Now these are only example values so make sure that you check the specs of your specific batteries or cells that you're using and set your settings accordingly. So now we need to check if the communication is actually working. So we can select LRBMS and then you should see this screen. So on the left side of the screen, the actual or real-time battery stats are shown. So we've got battery voltage, battery current, charge and discharge, battery temperature. I'm not sure which probe this is referring to because there's four probes uh, on, this on this BMS. So maybe some testing down the line might reveal that. We've got state of charge and then state of health. The right side shows the BMS charge and discharge limits. For battery charge voltage, this is either the RCV or the requested charge voltage or the RFV requested float voltage that you've got set in the BMS. And you'll notice that this value will change depending on where the BMS is in its charge cycle or its charge algorithm. I'll show you a little bit more about this later. Then the charge current limit, now this is the continued charge current limit as set in the BMS, but something to note, it is that limit less 5% for a bit of a buffer zone. And then we've got the discharge current limit and this is the continued discharge current limit as set in the BMS, again less 5% for a bit of a buffer. Now even though everything seems to be working fine, I think it is still a good idea to check that the numbers being reported to your inverter match the numbers and the settings in your BMS. And if they do, that's pretty much it. Everything is connected and communicating. Now, if you don't see this screen, then you may be seeing this screen with a whole lot of numbers and everything is zeros. And this means the communication is not working correctly. Now, if this happens, you may be like me and you've forgotten to plug the comms cable in, or it's possibly a fault with your comms cable or your ethernet cable. Uh, maybe that pin or can high and low is on the 
incorrect pinout or maybe even just some of the settings are incorrect. Either way, let us know in the comments how this turned out for you guys. So if you're connecting two batteries or two BMSs or maybe more in parallel, then one of the BMSs needs to be set as a master and the other BMSs need to be set as slaves. And each BMS needs to have its own separate address. Therefore, uh, we set whichever BMS we want as the master, we set that to zero. So basically all of the dip switches should be switched off. Then we can set the slave BMS to address number one on the dip switches. Or if you've got multiple slave batteries, then just set each slave battery to a different address in the sequence. So what I mean by that is slave battery number one is set to address number one, slave battery number two, set that to address number two, and number three, set it to number three, and number four, set it to number four, and so on. Also make sure that the CAN protocol number in each BMS is set to, in our case, 001 dia or day low voltage hybrid inverter and remember this is set in the BMS app basically the same as what we did earlier and if you want to confirm what address has been set on the dip switches you can just scroll up and see the device address that has been set so now you can go ahead and plug the ethernet cable into the CAN port on the master BMS and the other end of the ethernet cable plug that into the inverters CAN or RS-485 port and now that there are multiple batteries, we need to connect them up so that they can all communicate together. So we plug an ethernet cable into the RS-485 parallel port on the master BMS. And the other end of this uh, ethernet cable, you plug into the RS-485 parallel port on the slave battery. And in this case, I'm using the blue ethernet cable that came with these BMSs. Now in the settings menu, once again, select battery, select battery type, and then on the screen, select lithium and set your battery capacity, the maximum charge amps and the maximum discharge amps. In this case, there are two 100 amp hour battery packs. So for battery capacity, I've got that set to 200 amp hours. Then for the charge, each battery is capable of being charged at 0.5 C or 50 amps. So 50 times two is 100 amps. So I set 100 amps. And in the discharge section, each battery is capable of being discharged at 50 amps or 0.5 C. So 50 amps times two is once again 100 amps. So again, I set 100 amps. Now just keep this in mind again, these are only example values. So check the specs of your specific battery packs and set your settings accordingly. This is very important. You don't want to damage uh, your expensive batteries. And lastly is the BMS error stop setting. Now, if this is activated, if the BMS fails to communicate for whatever reason with the inverter, the inverter shuts down and will report a fault. And as you can see at the moment, I've just left this unchecked, but of course you guys need to make the decision whether you want this feature to be active or not. So once you've decided that, you can select can and then click OK. And as you can see, this once again goes back to the settings menu. Now we can select LRBMS and then you should see the battery communications page. So now that there are two batteries or two BMSs in parallel, the limits of each battery should be added together and all of that should be displayed here. So let's first look at the charge and discharge current limits. You'll notice that the charge current limit is displayed as 95 amps. And that is because each BMS is set to a max charge current of 50 amps. So 50 amps times two is 100 amps. But as I mentioned earlier, it looks like the BMS is deducting 5% for a bit of a buffer zone. Um, and that's what it's gonna report to the inverter. So. 100 amps less 5% is 95 amps. And the same goes for the discharging current limit, which is also displayed as 95 amps because each battery is set to a max discharge current of 50 amps. So again, 50 amps times two is 100 amps and the BMS is gonna deduct 5% for that buffer zone, um, and that's what's gonna be reported to the inverter. So 100 amps less 5% is going to be 95 amps. So here's a question, what happens if one of the BMSs were to disconnect, or maybe be manually deactivated for whatever reason? Would the settings or the limits on the inverter be updated? Well, if you guys wanna hazard a guess to this, let us know in the comments, but we'll get to that shortly. So I'll give you an example. This is the control section of BMS number two. And when I turn off the charge control of BMS number two, the charge current limit on the inverter is updated to only allow the maximum charge current that is set in BMS number one. In this case, it's 50 amps less than 5% which equals 47 amps, or more accurately, it's actually 47.5 amps, but you can see it's rounded down to 47 amps. And the same is gonna apply for the discharge current limit where if I turn off the discharge control in BMS number two, the discharge current limit of or on the inverter is updated to only allow the maximum discharge limit that is set in the BMS number one. So in this case, again, it is 50 amps, less 5%, and you can see 
47 amps is displayed. Now, when it comes to the charge voltage limits, things are a little bit different here. Because we've got a master BMS, the master BMS will dictate to the inverter what the charge voltage limit will be, irrespective of what the limits in the slave BMS are set to. And this is quite important to keep in mind. So in the master BMS, I have an RCV or a requested charge voltage of 3.45 volt set, which is a total of 55.2 volts for 16 cells. And it's gonna hold this for an RCV time of 0.1 hours or six minutes. And after this, the charge voltage should decrease to the RFV voltage or your requested float voltage of 3.35 volts or a total pack voltage of 53.6 volts. And it's gonna hold this voltage for an RFV time of 0.1 hours or again, six minutes. After this, the BMS should send a request to rebolt the battery, basically charging it back up to the RCV again. Now, just something to note that I've got these short time sets so that we can all see what's happening in a reasonable amount of time, how these requests are sent through to the inverter and how the inverter reacts and how the screen changes. Here, the pack voltage reaches 55.2 volts at 29 days, nine hours, three minutes and 49 seconds. So six minutes later, it should request the float voltage or RFV voltage from the inverter. Now the video has been sped up so that you guys can see the six minutes pass very quickly, but at 29 days, nine hours, nine minutes and 49 seconds, the RFV should be sent to the inverter. And exactly six minutes later, the battery charge voltage on the inverter changes to 53.6 volts, which is of course the RFV that we set in the BMS. So now after another six minutes or at 29 days, nine hours 15 minutes and 49 seconds because that's what we said in the bms it should change back over to the rcv of 55.2 volts and bang on 15 minutes and 49 seconds it updates the inverter charge voltage to 55.2 and here's another example of the master versus slave bms when it comes to the charge voltage limits for example, if I set a higher RCV in the slave battery, then no new RCV is sent through to the inverter because this is the slave battery and not the master BMS. However, if I go and update the master BMS, so if I update the RCV voltage to a higher voltage in the master BMS, as you notice, uh, the RCV value or the requested charge voltage on the inverter changes. So just a couple of additional notes. Number one, if your communication is lost, then the LRBMS screen will look like this. But after plugging the CAN communication back in, the battery information should pop up again. Number two, for communication between two or more batteries, you need to plug the network cable into the RS-485 parallel ports on both the batteries not the RS-485 port that is next to the CAN port on the BMS. Number three, if your master BMS is turned off, then all battery communications will be lost. And number four, your charge and your discharge limits displayed in the inverter screen should update according to the number of batteries that you've got installed. So for example, this shows the sum of both the BMS limits added together. Now, if you've got, of course, two or three or four or five battery packs, it'll add all of these up, but it'll still deduct that 5% buffer zone. So what was the simple mistake that I made that caused me to chase my tail around and not get the stuff communicating? Well, originally when I updated the firmware on both of the BMSs, I started off by setting the master BMS to address number one and the slave BMS to address number two. And everything actually updates perfectly well using the monitoring software with these number one and number two addresses set. So long as you select the correct address next to the COM port in the monitoring software, but after everything updated, I went ahead and connected everything, both batteries back up to the inverter, and the inverter would only recognize one of the batteries. So I disconnected the slave battery and connected the master battery, and it recognized and communicated fine. Then I disconnected the master battery and connected the slave battery without changing any settings, and that also connected and communicated just fine. But as soon as I connected both of the batteries in parallel with all of the communication cables, it would only see one of the batteries and damn it, I was chasing my tail around. And then I remembered the master BMS needs to be set to address number zero. And then the slaves need to be set to address number one and two and three and four, depending on how many slave batteries you have. So as soon as I realized that and set everything up correctly, I plugged it in and all the communication was working and the inverter uh, was aggregating the data for both of the batteries.
And this simple mistake caused me to chase my tail around. So here's a question. Are these charge and discharge limits from the BMS actually going to be the hard limits? Well, interesting result. I've tested this and it may not be exactly what you think. So in an upcoming video, I'll test how the inverter limits and the BMS limits interact with each other. Because under certain conditions, the inverter limits will take preference and under other conditions, the BMS limits will take preference. Now, before this video comes out, if you guys want to hazard a guess as to how you think this works, let us know in the comments. Well, if you found the video useful, please hit the like button, share it with anybody that you think may be interested in these types of videos. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time. Cheers.